Well, today we're going to talk about our persuasive service. We've been sharing with you now for the, this whole year about connecting to serve in 2021. And if again, if you would like to have a part in serving uh, in the music ministry, man, it's open. They practice on Wednesday nights. And so they'd love to have you come and be a part of that. So Patrick, I'm trying to persuade them in. That's a persuasive service. Amen. But we're connecting to serve, connecting to God, connecting to the church, and connecting to others, and connecting to people. And now we're talking about service. Today I want to look at persuading service. It's a service of persuasion to encourage people, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So if you have your Bibles, if you will, look into the book of Psalm chapter 34. We're going to start reading at verse 8, going to be reading through verse 10. Psalm 34, 8 through 10, and we're going to be looking today at the psalmist writing to encourage people to realize how good God is, that they, he would encourage them to, to, to put their trust in God. Just as we here today, as we're serving God, part of our service is to encourage people to persuade them to, to come to Jesus. And so the psalmist here is writing just that. Psalm 34, verses 8 through 10. Let's stand if you can in honor of reading God's word this morning. You at home, join us as well with that scripture that you'll see. The Bible says here, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O fear the Lord of you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions, they lack su and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today and we thank you for your blessing. God, thank you for allowing us to have such a great time of worship together. And Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to speak to us as, as, we, as we go into your word. And Father, I pray that the words that I'm about to say, they're going to be your words. I pray that this is the message that you, that you have that, Lord, that you made. And I pray the response from everyone here in this room and those watching this through live stream, I pray that that response would be, Lord, as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The last couple of weeks I've been preaching about the, the compelling, compel them to come. I, I shared the last two weeks on the text of, of the, the master who ma made a great feast. And he said, go, and to his servant said, go and compel them to come in that my house might be full and to the great banquet. Well, today this is another part of that. It is now to persuade people to come and be a part of that. As we are now into the month of September with our outreach explosion, it's to be encouraging. This is what we're doing. This is what we're called to do as the church is to now go out and to encourage people, to let them know how good God is and how amazing he is and what he can do in their lives to persuade them by any means to, to come and to give their life to Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this text today, we're looking at the, of, of compelling them to come. We look and we see a couple things. The first one in this text is the call. The call that the psalmist here is issuing out to the people is the same call that we are issued out to here today, but that we as Christians are to also now go out into the world and issue them the call. And the call is very simple, very basic. It is to taste and see. The psalmist says here, hey, folks, taste and see. And what does he want them to taste and see? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, this taste and see is meaning to try and experience it for yourself. Because I believe with all my heart, there are so many people that are coming into churches all across the nation. And they spend so much time in the church and they're, they're in, trying to grasp hold of what everybody else is doing and what, it, what God means to them. But the psalmist is saying, quit trying to rely on everybody else. Quit trying to rely on what you experience in the worship and just try for yourself. Taste for yourself. Experience God in a great way. Don't experience church. Don't experience religion experience God truly through Jesus Christ, experience him. And when you do, you're going to be satisfied. You're going to know that God is good. He said, try it 
for yourself. So today, the call is for us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, the call goes out, I believe, to two groups. The first group is those who are, with, are without Christ. He's going to the, to the lost, and he's saying, hey, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to go through to Jesus and get to, through him, you can get to God. He said, you need to go and you need to try Jesus. So I'm here today to encourage you and you at home that if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today don't try religion. You might be telling me, oh, I've gone to church for years. I never get anything out of it. I watch the church for years. I never get anything out of it. I, I go to Bible studies. I don't get anything out of it. Well, all of those are not what you're supposed to be testing. Don't try these things. Try God through Jesus Christ, and then you'll see that he is good. That Because people without Christ have no knowledge of how good God is. And we must address that issue to them. Folks, if anybody knows how good God is, it should be us. Amen? Amen. The world doesn't know. And I think sometimes we get so blinded by that thought, and we think, why in the world can't they do what they're supposed to do? Why can't they make the decisions they're supposed to make? Why can't they go in the direction they're supposed to go? And it's quite frankly, they don't know God. Amen. And for them to know God, then they would be able to experience him in a great way. So it, the, the psalmist here doesn't want readers to merely take his word for it. I don't want you to be saying anything or doing anything because I said so. The psalmist here is saying, I want you to experience God for yourself, not through my message, not through my compelling, not through anything. I want you to experience him for yourself because it is by Christ alone that you're going to experience God. It's in a language as, as a young, young convert. In other words, he's excited about it. I asked in the first service this morning, how many of you remembered with the day you received Christ as your Savior. So I ask you, how many of y'all remember the day you were saved? May you remember that and, and you remember the excitement? Do you remember how thrilled you were? And do you remember how nothing else mattered for maybe a, a, a short time, a year, two years, five years? Some of you may be still like the same day you got saved. But I shared with you before the night that I received Jesus as my Savior. Man, I, I hadn't been in church my, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I was raised in a good home, but not a Christian home. Now, my brother had received Jesus at an early age, some years before. As a matter of fact, he had received Jesus and had surrendered over to a, a, a preaching ministry. And I was oblivious to all that. I mean, I knew that he had done it. I knew what he was saying, but I never experienced it. But now I remember the night that I went I went to a revival at Shelter First Baptist Church. I was 17 years old. It was just a few months before I was to graduate high school. I had never really attended church at all. But I got invited and I wanted to go see because they had a man who was a chalk artist. And what he would do is he would preach. And while he was preaching, he was drawing. Man, he was really cool. And I was amazed by that. And then all of a sudden at the end to really push home his message, he would turn out all the lights and he'd have a black light and all the stuff that he had drawn in the middle of that was another picture and just made you go, wow. So I, I went, man, I said, oh, I like that. So I went the first night and I went back the second night. I liked it again, but then something began to work. And I was like, I don't, I don't know about this. I feel a little uncomfortable. So I really had to talk myself into even going back the third night. Because I, I just, I, I, I wanted to go and have fun. I wanted to go and be amazed by his stuff. And I wanted to hear, because he was really a great speaker. And I wanted to hear that. But then I got to feeling uncomfortable. So I went the third night, and sure enough, man, God began to work on my heart. And I went forward, and I received Jesus as my Savior that night. Third night of revival, 1981, Shelter First Baptist Church, Shelter, Oklahoma. Just a few months before I graduated high school, I, got, I got received Jesus in my, in my life. And folks, I want to tell you, I got excited about that. I was thrilled. I remember that night how excited I was. I've told this testimony to some of you before. But man, I remember I went home and, and uh, I, I said, uh, I want to go tell my mom and dad I got saved. Well, I did. I rushed in the door and I said, Mom, Dad, you won't believe what happened to me now that I got saved. 
Now, my mom and dad, you got to remember, they weren't churchgoers. They, praise the Lord, later they, they received Christ in their life. But at that time, they hadn't. They went, oh, well, good. We're, we're proud of you, son. That's, that's good. I said, hey, guess what? I'm going to go with the youth group. They've invited me to go with them. I'd never been to the youth group before. I'd never been invited to the youth group before. So they invited me to go to the youth group, and so I went. We were going to go eat some pizza, and I remember getting in the car going, hey, we're going to go eat some pizza with the youth group. And I remember I was so excited about being saved. I got to the restaurant, and the lady came and took our order. I said, hey, you know what happened to me tonight? She said, what? I said, man, I got saved. You know what her response was? Oh, that's good. What would you like to drink? (laughs) You know what? Listen, no one responded really well to my great news. But you know what? It didn't deter me. I was so excited. I wanted everyone to know, one, what happened to me, and two, I wanted them to be happy to know the same thing. So I didn't want to experience. I felt so good. I knew Christ had made such a great impact on my life that night, something I had never experienced before, and I wanted someone else to know what I knew. I remember that. And for several days, I went to school. I told people at school. I told two teachers who had been praying for me for a couple of years, kept asking me about God in my life, and I'd humor them. But man, I couldn't wait to tell them, and they got excited. I wanted people to know what I felt and what I experienced through Jesus Christ. And it's with that excitement, listen to me, it's with that excitement that the psalmist said, hey folks, taste and see that God is good. He wasn't doing it for himself. He wasn't just standing up speaking anything. He said, I know what it's like. I know what he's done for me. And it is absolutely so amazing that I want you to know it. And folks, listen, can I tell you, That's the excitement and the zeal that the church needs to have so that we can encourage people, if you will, persuade them to taste and see that God is good. And how do we do it? By telling them God's good. By living to them, God is good. It's kind of like we we see it's a language from the the woman at the well. I shared a message just a couple of Sunday nights ago when we had our Never Thirst service. And I shared with you the the story of the woman at the well. And and you'll remember when Jesus finally revealed to himself who, revealed to her who he was. He said, I am the Messiah. She began to believe and she had faith. And you'll remember her response. I mean, she got excited. She said, I'm going to go into town and I'm going to tell everybody because something had changed in her life. And so she went and you remember, she said, she ran into town and said, hey, all of y'all, you got to come and see this man that told me everything about my life. You got to come. He is the Christ. And so here's what's so cool is that people were enthralled by her testimony that they were going to follow her. Now, what is so big deal about that? Well, if you'll remember in the story when she was talking to Jesus, and Jesus had even asked her, why are you here during the hot of the heat of the day? Why are you, not, why are you here by yourself? And you remember her response was, no one wants anything to do with me. No one, because of my life, no one wants anything to do with me. So I have to come. I am rejected by everybody. But listen to me. When she went into the town... She went with such an excitement of of persuasion. Come and see for yourself. Come and see this man. Surely this is the Messiah. They caught on that something was different about her. They wanted to go out and to find what it was that she saw, and they went out. But now listen, the great part of that story is the people that went out to see Jesus, they believed. But here's what I want you to understand in the story in John chapter 4. The people who went out there looked at her and said, then they said to the woman, now we believe that which you persuaded us to come and see, we believe, not because of what you said, for we have heard him and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. You persuaded us to come, 
But we now believe because we've come and we've tasted for ourselves. My friends, can I tell you, it wouldn't have worked if all they would have done was just believe what she said. Oh, it might have gotten them excited. They might have experienced some joy. They might have experienced a little bit, but they would have never experienced Jesus. So the psalmist is saying, I want you to come, which is what our outreach explosion is all about. Come and then taste for yourself. See for yourself, experience for yourself, not me, but experience him. Don't experience church, experience him. Don't experience Sunday school, experience him. Don't experience some little something, experience him. Taste and see for yourself that God is good. I believe there are so many people who are experiencing what Christians experience but they're not experiencing Jesus. They experience them. They experience good services. They experience good emotion. But my friend, it's really Jesus. Taste and see that he is good. Come and see for yourself. Only when they have repented of their sins and received Christ into their hearts can they truly experience him. But my friends, listen to me. We are called to go and to issue that call to them. Come and see. Experience him. Don't experience us. Experience him. So he comes and the call is to those who are without Christ. But it's also for those who are in Christ. You say, well, now wait a minute. Why is the call issued to us who know Jesus? Because we've already experienced him. Why is the call to the church? Why is the call out there to everyone else? First of all, it's there to be reminded, for us to be reminded of his goodness. Sometimes I think we forget how good God is. Oh, we say God is good. We've experienced the goodness of God through salvation. But all of a sudden, something has gone on that we've kind of lost that excitement. We've kind of lost that understanding, if you will. It's kind of like, I've experienced through my daughters and through several people here, and many of you know about the, the, when someone contracts COVID, one of the first symptoms is they lose their, their sense of taste and smell. My daughters did that. And so we were talking about it, and I said, well, how, how was the food? What, how, eating, did you enjoy eating? They said, well, no, not really, because they didn't enjoy it, because part of the enjoyment of eating is the taste, Amen. And I love to eat. I, it's obvious. I love to eat. But I couldn't imagine losing the sense of taste. And so what they said was that they, they, they had to eat. They knew they had to eat. But so what it was was eating was no longer a joy. It was a task. It was something they had to do to keep their strength up. They knew they had to do it, but there was no joy in it. And my friends, sometimes I wonder in the church, have we somewhere lost our sense of taste for the goodness of God? Oh, we, we come to church because that's a check mark. We go to Bible study because that's a check mark. We do all of these things because we can check them off of our box. But yet somewhere in there, we are going through the motions because we know this is what we as Christians are supposed to do. Folks, I'm telling you, because I have a great sense of taste, my wife is not going to have to remind me today when we go home, Harold, you got to eat something. <laughs> Amen? She's not going to have to tell me that. Why? Because I love eating. I want lunch. Huh? Huh? Someone should not remind me I have to serve God. I have to worship God. I have to read his word. I have to pray. I have to, I have to, I have to. 
No, because we love and we taste to the experience of God. I remember what it was like when I was excited about him. I remember when it was fresh. I remember when it was new. I remember that I woke up on Sundays and I was ready to go to church instead of saying, oh, I can't believe I have to get up today. My friends, we need to be reminded. So the psalmist now is talking to those who are without Christ. Hey, taste and see that God is good. He's now telling those who know Christ, taste and remember how good God is. Be reminded of his goodness. But not only be reminded, but also to be encouraged by his goodness. Folks, we're living in discouraging times. Amen? It's easily, we're easily discouraged today. Look at what's going on around us. It's easy to get tired. It's easy to get down. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to want to say, I quit. I want to give up. But we need to be reminded of God's goodness. Because can I tell you today, my God is a good God. We need to be encouraged at times when we become so discouraged by the events of life that it maybe shakes us to our very core of our existence. We need to be reminded that we don't have to be discouraged, that God is still there. God has never left me. God will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He will always be there with me. He will always be there lifting me up. He will always be there breathing life into me if I will just remember how good he is. So he's telling we who know him, remember, remember to taste and see that God is good. Be reminded of his goodness. Don't lose that zeal or that focus. Don't get so discouraged that you want to throw your hands up in the air and say, I quit, no matter what's going on. Remember, no matter what, our God is good. Remember that. Be encouraged by that. The second thing is, not only are we given a call, but man, we're given a promise. We're given a promise here. The promise is that God would make you blessed. Now, here's where a lot of people misinterpret what this is all about. A lot of people would interpret this as saying that if you trust God, that everything you want in life will be given to you. You will have plenty of money. You will have plenty of possessions. You will have lots of health. And everything is good. All you got to do is have faith. God wants you to be wealthy. That's not what this is, amen? He says that he will bless those. Blessed are those, the man who trusts in him. Blessed is the person who tastes and sees that God is good, experiencing, them, experiencing him for themselves. Blessed are they. So what does that mean? It says God will make you complete. Everything that you need. He meets all of our needs. Every, every piece of my, my life is, is now full. That he will make us complete. The Bible tells us here in Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in the sight. He said that everything you need in your life, he will give you. Whatever it is that you have to have, it will be there. That word complete is, is a word that means the process of repairing something that's broken. If your life is broken, taste and see that God is good and he will bless you. He will complete you. In other words, he will take that life that is broken and he will bring, it, bring repairing to it. He will take that which is damaged and he'll restore it. Any part of your life that's damaged, he said, I will restore that life. He said, anything that's torn, I will reconcile it. Everything that is now confused in your life. He says, by tasting and seeing that God is good, what he'll do is he'll take all of that that's confusing and he'll reorient it for you, that it will make sense. He will bring sense to your life. That's what he promises he will do for us. 
taste and see that God is good and he will complete those or bless those who trust in him. So the promise is God will make you complete, but the second promise is God will not fail you. Look at verse 10. Or verse 9, he says, Oh, fear the Lord for his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. You're made complete. He said, The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. That means God will always be there with you, and he will always be there for you, never turning his back on you. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says this, God, listen to me, God never fails anyone. Hey, can I tell you? I will fail you. Not on purpose. I will fail you. The church will sometimes fail you. Your family will sometimes fail you. Not on purpose, not deceptively, but folks, listen, we're not perfect. No one is perfect except Jesus Christ. So everything on this world will, listen to me, in some way, shape, or form, let you down. Sometimes. Someplace. But God, as he promises here, never fails anyone. Wow. If I trust in him, I put my faith in him, I taste and I see that he is good. He will not fail us at all. He will never let us down. Oh, listen, doesn't mean again that life is going to be absolutely hunky-dory perfect. Doesn't mean I'm going to get everything out there on my wish list. But it's going to mean that whatever I go through, God is going to be there with me. God is going to be an encourager to me. God is going to lift me up like wings of eagles and soar. That's the promise. And listen to me, I can tell you that's the promise because I know beyond a doubt he will not break his word. But the problem is we've got to taste and see. We've got to be remembered, remembering that it's true. And we've got to be willing as a church to surrender ourselves back over to him and say, God, here I am. God, I need you in my life. God, I trust you. And I need you desperately right now. God, I'm I'm going to remember how good you are. I remember what it was like. David, the psalmist who wrote a lot of these songs, If you'll remember one time, he kind of got his life off track. Man, he was a man after God's own heart, and he got his life off track. And he really messed up for for him and for, for, for another family and for the whole nation of Israel. He messed up. And you remember when the thing came and, and the prophet came and told him, said, David, you, you are that man. You are the one that messed up. You remember David repented of his sins and he cried out, God, restore back to me the joy of your salvation. Restore back. God, I remember what it was like. I remember when I tasted and I knew you were good. And God, I remember when I trusted in everything about you. And God, I also remember what it was like when I got off track. And and God, I went another direction. And I remember what my body was like. I remember what my spirit was like. I remember what my life was like. And God, I don't want to go there anymore. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. God, restore me back. Restore back to me the joy of that salvation I had. That God, you had given me. My friends, I believe all across America today, there's a lot of people in church need to be crying out, God, restore back to me the joy of your salvation that I once had. My life has gotten off track. Oh, it may have gotten off a little or it may have gotten off a lot. Either way, it's off. But God, restore back to me the joy. I want to know because I want to remember what it was like when it was fresh. And I want to remember how good you are to me. And God, I want to have that fire back because now I know what it was like. And I remember that it is so fresh in me. And God, I want other people to know that. 
I want them to see it in me. I want them to see it in my church. I want them to see it in my ministry. I want them to see it in everything that I got. And that, God, I can go out and I can tell them as, a, as an excited person not to check off my boxes, but, Lord, to just know that I am serving you because I want people to know what I know. I want them to experience what I have experienced. God, you are an amazing God. And the world needs to see that. The world needs to hear that. The world needs to know that. Use me today, God. Use me. My friends, that is the call to us. But that's the promise to us. Even then, God hasn't left us. And he never will leave us. But the world needs to know that. Amen? The world needs Jesus. And they need us to go and to have that persuasive ministry to encourage them to come back. So if you're here today or you're at home and you're watching this and, and you say, well, I, I've experienced God, I've experienced I mean, I've experienced the church, I've experienced religion, I've experienced, it just kind of left me empty. Then listen, you didn't experience God. You didn't taste God. You might have tasted some stuff with the word God on it, but you didn't experience God because God is good. And we experience him not by coming to church, not by following in baptism, not by reading the Bible, not by any other means except confessing our sins before him, receiving Jesus into our life as the only perfect sacrifice. That's how I experience God. Now, short of that, I'll experience a lot of other stuff. But it says, taste and see that God is good for yourself. So if you're here today, you're at home, and you're watching this, and, and you've tried a lot of stuff, but you don't feel that completeness, then I want, I, want to, I want to beg you. I want to compel you. Turn your heart to Christ. Taste him and see. Experience forgiveness. Experience salvation that you might see. And if you're here today or you're at home, and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved but man, I've lost that zeal somewhere. I've gotten confused. I've, man, I've gotten off track. But today, man, I, I, I wanna, I'm reminded of what it was like. And today, I want it back. God, would you restore to me the joy of your salvation that I can be used to persuade others. Use my life, Lord. I'd like you to bow your head as the praise team comes on back up as we now step into this time of invitation. This is the moment that, that we can call out to God and say, God, here I am. So if you're here today, let me ask you. If you've never received Jesus in your life, if you've experienced religion or you've experienced church or you've experienced baptism, you've experienced something else, I want to encourage you today, for the first time, ex experience God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So today, if you're here and you, you're not sure if you have that relationship with God, would you just call out to his name today and say, God, forgive me. I have tried so many different things to get to you. I've even tried my own righteousness, and I'm failing miserably. So God, today, I ask you to forgive me of my sins through Jesus Christ, that he can wash away my sins by his death on the cross, and that I can be brought to new life because of his resurrection. God, I want to taste and see. I want to experience for myself salvation through Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, listen, if you prayed that prayer and, and you, you are tasting the goodness of God, maybe today like you've never experienced it. And I don't want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. I won't come to you. I won't, I won't do anything. 
But man, if you prayed that prayer or if you need to pray that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something real quick. I've been doing it the last few weeks just so I can see. I know. No one else is looking. If you prayed that prayer or you need to pray that prayer, would you quickly just let me know by raising your hand very quickly. I won't come to you. I'll just pray for you. I want him to say your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, you said, Lord, amen. There we go. Oh, I experienced him today. And you at home, the same. I can't see you, but I want to pray for you. I want to do that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe, I believe you moved here today. Because I saw some hands come up. Oh, Father, thank you. Oh, my heart is excited. I pray that they're experiencing you for the first time because of Jesus. And I pray, God, you would give them strength and encouragement to do what I did that night and be so excited I couldn't wait to tell people because it was new and it was exciting. Father, for those here today, I pray over them. I thank you for the decisions they've made. Father, I pray for those at home for the decision I believe that are being made there. Father, I believe your spirit's moving and you're calling people to, to true salvation. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Thank you for letting me know. And if you want to visit, man, I want to visit with you after church or here in just a moment when we sing, if you want to come forward. If you're at home, you made a decision. If you'll just call the church office, someone will be there to talk to you, pray with you, because we've not forgotten you either. But I believe some of you at home made that decision. Praise God. And the last one, before we step into the singing part, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I've experienced God through Jesus Christ for forgiveness of my sin. I know that. But Pastor, today I need to pray that God will restore back to me the joy that I experienced in my salvation, that he gave me. I've gotten off track in some way. Life has been heavy. I've got some great burdens. I just need you today to pray for me. Well, I'm going to lead you in a prayer as well. And I just want you to pray that God would recognize your prayer and all you pray is Father I thank you that that one day you saved me I know it and it's, it's real and I praise your name for salvation that no one else could give me but Jesus but Lord now the world has been heavy the world has been distracting. Something's going on, and Lord, I've, I've kind of gotten off a little bit. And I've lost some of that joy. So today, I call out as David did. Restore back to me. Please, God, forgive me. And restore back to me the joy of your salvation. That I can have that excitement again, that zeal again. That I can, can encourage people to come and taste and see. Father, restore back to me that joy. In Jesus' name. Oh, man, that's what God wants to hear from his church, that we could be restored. And if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to pray over you as well. But during this next few moments, during this song, if, if God's laying on your heart and you need to come, grab somebody, come pray with them, come pray with me, call the office, whatever you need. This invitation is for you. The call has been given. The response is here. Father, thank you for the decisions I know that have been made. Thank you. And now, Lord, if there's someone else that still needs to make that decision during this time, God, you would speak to them. Call them to taste and see. Taste and see. Be with these next few minutes of this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Church, I'm going to ask you.